Uh, well, friends, I've got five lecturettes for you. And uh, they're going to involve a, a fair bit of work, so in between each one we'll, uh, we'll stand up and, uh, and, and clear the brain and get ready to start again. I've had to divide it into five parts because there are several matters I want to cover. In the first one, I want to talk to you about the uh, Australia in the global situation, Australia in a global economy, uh, what that uh, means to us. I then want to talk about our opportunities in Australia for Australian development, various things we can do and, and, the, and the problems that beset us in getting on with those jobs. Then in the third address, I want to cover the, if you like, the constitutional and political situation in Australia and I address the question of who is responsible for doing what in Australia. In the, in the fourth one, uh, I talk about the Great Artesian Basin and to talk to you about the uh, problems of groundwater in Australia and in the world and, and the damage we're doing in the area of the Great Artesian Basin. And finally, in the fifth one, I talk about our social responsibilities to one another and the way I perceive things have changed uh, in, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, um, I should point out, I'm, I'm 78 next birthday in November. That's next month I'm 78. And uh, we're, when you talk about 50 years of experience, I got pretty close to 60. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, I find that I'm rather a rare bird these days in the sense that I was there and did things which people with my background and training cannot do today in Australia. In other words, uh, and I saw this at the university, when I saw the young people graduating you know, from our School of Engineering, I kept on thinking they may not have the same opportunities for professional development as I had. They may not have the opportunities to fly high as, as young eagles in engineering as I had. And I think it is, is rather sad. Things have changed and I want to talk to you about that in the, in the final episode of, of all of these talks. So now we'll turn on the uh, projector and we'll talk about the first one. This is Australia in a global economy. National development. Have you got that's my uh, yeah just behind me. Now uh, that strange-looking map is a map of Australia in the new digital elevation method of recording. These days we've got satellites in the sky, and they can measure the height of the land very accurately and its position. And so all of Australia is now covered with these satellite images and we we have contours you know, to a meter level if we want it and we have details of elevations anywhere we want it. So there's great new tools available to us if we want to get on with the job. Now, here is Australia and there's our markets. There are potential markets for Australia, China of 1200 million. The, the uh, Premier or Prime Minister of China is coming to Australia this week. 1,200 million people, Australia is a potential source of matters that the products that they need. India, 1,000 million, Japan, Indonesia, Korea, and so on. Now, that is a total of 3 billion people in Asia and the Middle East. It's a huge growing market for Australia. So just think of 3 billion people as a potential close market and 22 million in Australia. Oh, thank you. Now, I've already been quoted on this. Uh, the world population is growing at the rate of one Australia every three months. 
we cannot take a static view of Australia and the world. Things are changing dynamically, and that dynamism has to be incorporated into our policies and politics. And the population in Asia is growing at the rate of one every six months. That's very close to us. That implies certain obligations and challenges to Australia. Now, this is a map showing the population growth in Australia since Federation. And uh, when the Constitution was written, here we were, with separate states, and each state at that time saw themselves as virtually as an independent country. Back here, when we had less than five million people, every state in Australia uh, had their own, uh, believe it or not, defence forces. They managed their own economy. They had their own state ports and railways. Uh, they issued their own postage stamps. As a boy, I used to collect the postage stamps of the individual states. And so that's what Australia was. During the 1950s, there was a population increase of 25% in Australia. And that was a time of great development and excitement in Australia. We were very progressive at that, at that time. The growth in population seemed to stimulate much development. The population of Australia has increased five times since Federation. Now, is it possible for us to have a target of 25 million by the year 2010? Is that reasonable? We've, as you know, in the papers today, they're talking about the 20 millionth Australian. Now, how do you like the idea of 25 million by the year 2010? I think that sort of thing is possible. And as I talk to you about the various projects and jobs that I have in mind, there'd be jobs for everybody. The world population is increasing like this, and we have to think about it. There are lower projections these days, uh, taking in mind the fact that people might die of AIDS, or they might start using much uh, more birth control than at present. But the evidence of the developed countries is, is that, uh, uh, if you like, we decline in population as we are at the moment. Australia is virtually not at a sustainable population level. So we have to look at that and wonder how is Australia going to approach its immigration policy in a world that is growing, like I indicate. Now, the other thing to remember is that the growth in this world population is largely, largely in the cities. Now here we are, these are uh, projections. That's a projection for 2015. And that's a projection that Jakarta could easily be 21 million people in the year 2015. That's a city with a population equal to the present population of Australia. And so we're going to have a huge market right there, very close to Australia. At the same time, we've got Tokyo, could, which could be 28 million, and Shanghai, 23. Uh, last year, I was in Shanghai. I've never seen more dynamic civil engineering development in all my life. It was absolutely wonderful and exciting to see what they're doing, and particularly this uh, maglev train. Now, on top of the surge in population, there is a problem of water. Now, all around the world, the wells are drying up. Now, it just so happens that there's something like two billion people at least who depend on groundwater for daily survival for water. And it, these are absolutely huge numbers. And there are many cities around the world that depend on groundwater. And we all think of water in Australia. Uh, we all think of water as a problem of surface water supplies. In Melbourne, we think of water as a problem of surface water supplies. There are many large cities the size of Melbourne that are totally dependent on groundwater. And the wells are drying up. The drilling of millions of wells have pushed water withdrawals beyond any possible recovery. We're incurring a water deficit. It's invisible, unrecognized, and unreported. The world is consuming water, which belongs to future generations. 
and it's leading to food deficits, and it's driving hundreds of millions of people off their lands. Now, well, these days we have photographs of the Earth in natural colour. And you can see the huge dry areas of the Sahara, Saudi Arabia, right through the Middle East, up into here. And those people in those areas have been long dependent on groundwater for their water supplies. And the decline is driving people off their lands. And some of the major problems are here in India and in the North China Plain up there in China. But a lot of the, reason, a lot of the regions uh, where the groundwater supplies are declining are Muslim countries. This has an enormous implication for international politics. We also have to focus on the fact that there are many countries around the world that are hungry. World hunger in 1999, and they say greater than 35%. So there's a tremendous hungry population there in, in, in uh, Africa and in that part of Asia, up in here in Mongolia, uh, Central Africa again. And allied with the hunger is a scarcity of arable land. And so this is in billions of people. And at the present moment, the population in scarcity is that yellow. And this is the projection that is likely to occur uh, without substantial development of new arable lands. So there's a tremendous problem of scarcity of arable land and we in Australia we have something to offer. So India. This is a photograph of India in natural colour as seen from space. You see the Himalaya right through there? Great ridge there and all of that peninsula there the ground water is drying up. And unfortunately in India they've been captivated by the idea is that the private sector has all the answer and democracy. And groundwater was regarded as a democratic resource, meaning it was available to any farmer who had access to a pump. There was an explosive growth. Groundwater irrigation now creates more rural, rural wealth than any other irrigation in India. So they're heavily dependent on groundwater, but the wells are drying up and it's catastrophic. And so India faces an enormous problem as their wells are drying up. And what's happening is that as the rich farmers put down a pump, the wells of the poor farmers dry up and they migrate to the cities. And that's the sort of wells they have in all these farming areas of India with a pump and a place where the women come and collect the water and carry it home. An awful lot of the water that is used is carried home by the women on their heads. In the desert regions, for, and this is welter wells that go back for centuries, they dug these deep wells and people went down to collect the water. But that's a steady natural flow. And if the limit is exceeded, the well dries up. It does not help very much to go deeper because it's a fairly constant flow. Here's the problem in North China. The North China Plain up here. In 1996, the North China Plain had 3.6 million wells. That's an awful lot of gr groundwater wells, 3.6 million. In 1997, 99,000 wells were abandoned and 220,000 new wells were drilled. You get the idea? The well drillers are now chasing the water down as it falls about three metres a year. So there's a great competition for water and they're drilling deeper and deeper holes and putting in stronger and stronger pumps. Now on the North China Plain here, the present water uses now exceed sustainable supply by that, which is a flow of water, more five times more than the entire 
annual irrigation use in the Murray-Darling Basin. So you've got to remember China, huge populations, huge problems. They're chasing the water down and they're using their water at this rate. It's inevitable uh, that the Chinese Premier is coming to Australia to talk nice talks to our Prime Minister. They have huge problems up there and we are a place that may have, uh, in effect, Australia could be a food bowl for China. Think about that possibility. As the water tables fall, springs dry up, streams cease to flow and lakes disappear. Hai Bay province once had a thousand lakes, only 83 remain. And so China is looking for food, a source of food, food imports, especially grain. China will be a, a big market for Australian grain. Other countries in serious water deficit include Yemen, Iran, Egypt, Mexico, Ghana, Morocco, Pakistan. Those are the Muslim countries. This is all part of international politics. And you see what happens when the wells dry up? Uh, 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 people leave the land. Could you get any more on there? <laughs> okay. So look at the global changes. In the past 20 years, there's been a growth of industrial countries, uh, production in the poor countries, particularly Asia, decline of industrial production in the rich countries. The appearance of prosperity in the rich countries was sustained by the creation of credit. Now, we did this, this in America and in Australia. And devaluation and asset sales. You know, we sold the Commonwealth Bank and passed Telstra and the State Electricity Commission Victoria and things like that. We were selling asset sales to maintain an appearance of prosperity. There was excessive stock market valuations, emphasis on quick returns, growth of global corporations, and growth of global speculation. We haven't seen the end of that yet. So, I now want to talk about the way the world grows. The incredible thing is that if you do a plot like this of the global growth in electricity production just on an arithmetic scale, that is a straight line for 28 years. Now, in essence, what is happening, that reflects a fairly constant uh, rate of expenditure on new electricity development. And the net result is that the world, the world, is growing at that, that rate. Now, to give you an idea, if you think of all of Australia, the cities of Australia, all of the factories and all of the farms, everybody that uses electricity, you think of all of Australia, you think of all the transmission lines we have up and down this place, all of the generating stations in, uh, uh, in the Trobe Valley and and the, all the coal-fired stations in New South Wales and Queensland and over in the Western Australia and so on, hydro in Tasmania and the Snowy Hydro, and you put it all together and you think of all this Australian activity in electricity generation and electricity consumption, the world, that is growing at a rate which is equal to Australia every seven months. So every seven months, the world as a whole increases electricity production by an amount equal to the entire electricity activity in Australia. Now that includes all of the generation and all of the consumption. So you've got to see this as a, as a very large population in the world and a growth at that rate. Now the interesting thing is that a large part of the growth is in the developing regions in Asia and so on. And in the Western world, we're tending to flatten off. And this is one of the problems that's occurred by this uh, maintenance of the appearance of prosperity by the creation of credit. It is, in effect, the creation of credit to sustain a drop in industrial capacity and in industrialization. So 
as in Australia and America, uh, as they shut down in manufacturing and they import manufactured goods from China and so on, they maintain an appearance of prosperity by printing money. And uh, worse is that the people like the Chinese are only too pleased to get on with uh, producing more and more manufactured goods and the Americans print the money and pay the Chinese. And then the Chinese have huge investments in America. They then take the money back and they uh, buy American treasury bonds and so on. So the inevitable consequence of that is that, believe it or not, the Chinese have an enormous uh, economic stranglehold on the United States. It's a very touchy state of affairs. So the world has become a vast casino because of all the printing of money. It involves millions of players and it never stops. The speculation is encouraged by credit. And people can buy without paying. You, you, you buy on credit. And you can sell without owning. <laughs> and there are banks that have got more commitments in spectra than the entire GDP. And the financial bubble threatens the world. And we, we are facing very serious prospects. Now, coming to the last one, the last, two last one in this, just in the last week, this was in our newspapers, I just scanned it off the newspaper, the proposed ASEAN Free Trade Agreement includes Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Brunei, Malaysia and Indonesia, and the Philippines of course, and they have a GDP of 720 billion. It's a huge economic group. And of course they're not too keen on us. You know, Australia keeps on hanging around the edges and saying uh, we want to be a member of this Asian free trade agreement and they are determined to go uh, do their own thing. And the reason why they want to do that is shown in the next slide. So there you are. Now, if you look at electricity production, this is just the ASEAN 6, not the total 10 of them now. And that's the way they've been growing. And this is the way Australia's growing. So you can see it, it, it is not a static relationship between Australia and the ASEAN countries. There is dynamic development there. Now you see, we're here in the year 2000. Let us think about what it's going to be like in, say, the year 2010. I'll be up there somewhere, look. And that changes their relationship with Australia quite dramatically. And not only does that mean that they'll have industries and industrial development, it means that they'll have the financial resources to go with it. Uh, they'll, they'll have, if you like, uh, dynamic and entrepreneurial companies that are searching the world for opportunities and they will continue to try to develop their manufacturing resources and once again they'll be looking to Australia as a potential source of resources just you know, the iron ore and the natural gas and things like that and minerals and also as a source of food so we have to accept the fact that we have a dynamic world situation. Our near neighbours are growing very rapidly and they're going to have a vast influence on the way we plan and build Australia. Now that's what I'm going to talk about next. Well, are you ready? Let's talk about the potential of Australia. And as I indicate here, when we think about national development, it's important that we think of it as an integrated whole. Transport, road, rail, air, irrigation and water projects, they should be planned as an integrated plan for strategic development of the nation as a whole. They must be market directed. In other words, we don't build things just to build them. They are built with a purpose to open up market opportunities for Australia. Now, in order to plan, I'm repeating ourselves, there's a growing world population, 
a global water deficit and a financial crisis. These are all going to have an impact on Australian development. Now, where is the surplus water? And up here, in the north of Australia, we have the concentration of Australian runoff. Now, runoff is the water that ends up in the rivers and flows to the sea. And you can see that 20% of Australia's runoff is in the Kimberley up there, and 23% is in the Gulf Country. And here, you know, in the Murray-Darling Basin, it's only 6%. But up there, it's very much greater. And there's possibilities for two crops a year, because, in effect, the rain comes down in the monsoon season in our summertime here, from December to April, and you can grow crops while the rain is falling. And then there's so much water that it can be stored in storage dams and made available for irrigation in the dry, in the dry season. And so up in this country up here, not only is this huge runoff, there is a prospect over many places of two crops a year. And the reason why nothing has happened up there is access to markets. If, if you provide access to markets, economic development happens. Now, when I was a boy, in 1941, at the height of the Japanese capture of Southeast Asia, and the Japanese got as far as the red line there, some leading strategists in Australia proposed what is known as the Brisbane Line. That was a line of defence of the southeast of Australia, assuming that the Japanese would capture the rest. Now, when the Japanese were surging along like this, the state premiers waited on the Prime Minister, and the state premiers each wanted an e a, a state share of the National Army, Navy, and Air Forces. Each, each state wanted to have their own defence forces because the Japanese were coming, and they wanted to defend each of the state capitals. And this was the time when MacArthur and others, and they were looking, and so they thought, well, this is about what we can do if we get involved in a land confrontation with the Japanese. And if you're travelling now on the new, on the New England Highway, you know, Tenterfield up there, and just south of the border on the New England Highway, if you go to Tenterfield, you can see the trenches, the trenches that they dug on the top of the range. I don't know why, but they did. And these fortifications were built in order to defend New England from the invading Japanese. I don't even, don't even know which direction they are coming from. <laughs> but these trenches are there. Now, that seems strange today. But in effect, the thought at the time was that the north of Australia was defenceless and it wasn't worth much, and it was best to concentrate on defending the southeast corner of Australia. And, but I'm saying the lands, rainfall, and rivers the north provide the potential for a region could be a food bowl for hundreds of millions of people. Now, so in effect, Australia still has the Brisbane line mentality. I've just been up in Broome and Fitzroy Crossing and having a look at the Fitzroy River and so on, we still have this mentality. And one of the reasons for that is a, 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 a thing called native title. And this is the geographic extent of the claimant applications before the federal court. You can see it, does, it doesn't, of course, this is the Federal Court, Northern Territory is not under the jurisdiction of the Federal Court. So anyway, it looks a bit weird, doesn't it? And there is the areas of native title claims showing the mineral sites. So all of this area, there are native title claims, all the red area, and all the black are the mineral sites. 
So the whole thing is really quite scandalous. And the reason why we got ourselves into this trouble was that when Keating and company were in power, the, the High Court of Australia gave this famous Marbo judgment where they said somebody on an island in the Torres Strait had been, and his family had been farming the land for two or three hundred years, and, and it was wrong of the Queensland government to try and take it away. So it was decreed that this chap, Eddie Marbo, had title to the land. And Keating thought, oh, this is a good idea, it'll solve the Aboriginal problem. Now, one of the reasons why Keating wanted to do something was this. The Aboriginal community is the largest growing community in Australia, and they're almost entirely on social welfare. One of the consequences of that is that they are also multiplying very rapidly, and any projection of federal social welfare expenditure shows an absolutely huge increase in social welfare claims, potential social welfare claims from the Aboriginal community. So Keating devised a concept of native title, in essence, where the idea uh, was to give the Aboriginals title to the land and, and Crown lands and others, and they would then be in a position to negotiate whereby they effectively claimed rent for the use of the land. So you've got to see that matter in relation to all these mining companies now. Uh, the Aboriginals were given a mechanism whereby they could uh, uh, claim some form of an income for rent of that land. Now, uh, some of the international mining companies don't like that very much and they're fairly rich. And so rather than paying rent, they wanted to settle by a capital sum. In other words, we're not gonna pay rent for 50 years, we'll, 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 we'll give the Aborigines half a million dollars each and uh, for every family, and they sign, they walk away from all their native title rights. And you get the, so the whole thing is a shambles, it, it really is. And so what has happened is that the north of Australia is, uh, if you like, just like the north of Australia was viewed at the time of the Brisbane line. We've drawn a Brisbane line uh, across Australia and we've said, in effect, up from there upwards, we'll, we'll let, uh, let it go. Now, I've just been in... Fitzroy Crossing and other places up there, been chatting to the Aboriginal communities. And one of the, I stayed, we stayed at an Aboriginal pub. And of course they queue up at, in the morning, so they get in the door when the pub opens at 10. And uh, they drink all day. And if you have a chat to them at three o'clock in the afternoon, they're pretty, pretty well gone and, and only too pleased to chat to you. <laughs> and, and it was really rather sad and that I found so many people I spoke to, uh, that they had no thought of the future or themselves. They'd lost their will to live. Their only interest was in sort of drinking and getting drunk. And when you saw them at six o'clock in the evening, it's easy to see while well, all they could do is just sort of try to stagger off home and, and beat up the wife. And outside the pub we were staying at, there's a little notice, or a big notice, alongside the road, and it says, be careful if you drink and drive, you might drive over some body. Now, the fact is that the bodies are actually lying on the road, because what happens is that uh, as the sun goes down and, and it starts to get cool again, the road is rather warm, and these guys that have been drinking all day in the pub and they can't get very far, they just simply lie down on the warm pavement and, 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 and that's it. And as you try and drive up to the pub, you're st driving, uh, driving around these guys who are prostrate on the road and, 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 and just won't move. But in essence, what Australians have done to our Aboriginal community is the cruelest and the most wicked thing 
we could ever do to anybody. And they talk about a policy of reconciliation and it's a policy of exclusion. It's not reconciliation at all, it's a policy of exclusion. It is certainly not a policy of inclusion. And the Aboriginals feel that they are excluded. And it's not good enough to give them native title and social welfare and then say, shut up and go away and don't interfere with us. It is a policy of exclusion. They feel rejected and they have nothing to live for. So as a consequence of my visit, I've been thinking about various ways we could build major projects up in the north and for all the markets in Asia that I've been talking about. What scared me in, in looking at the situation up in the northwest in particular was that if we had a situation where large international companies or big Chinese corporations came in and wanted to build uh, huge irrigation projects and told the Australian government, don't worry about the money, we'll, we'll provide the entire money for the project. And don't worry about new ports, we'll build the new ports at our own expense. And don't worry about the roads, we'll build the roads at our own expense. What's the Australian go government going to say when there's a large number of Aborigines there and how are they going to get on with native title? it creates an enormous problem and we're not going to solve it the way it is. So I have been thinking about ways in which we can put the Aboriginal communities to work and get on with the job and I think there is potential to do that. It's going to be hard work but certainly as it is at the moment, uh, no work and the dole, sit down money, is utterly destructive. It's the most cruel and wicked thing we could do to anybody and it's a policy of exclusion. And we must find ways of including them in, if you like, in e within economic Australia. So uh, the projects that I'm now going to talk about uh, have an element about them of getting on with the job using the Aboriginal population. Now, we have to accept the fact that our public capital expenditure in Australia has been dropping like a stone. I haven't brought it up to date, but in, in essence, public capital expenditure has virtually disappeared. And, and we don't have long-term planning anymore. The danger now is that by a policy of neglect, other countries and big international corporations can do our long-term planning for us. And I get worried about that. So, you've seen this before, we have this tyranny of distance and a lot of the things we've been trying to grow in the north are tyranny of distance crops. Cotton is a good example. You grow cotton, it'll keep and keep. You don't have to worry about getting it to market quickly. I'm thinking of horticulture and it means quick access to markets. We serve the growing populations and the growing markets and we have products for those growing markets. And so I want to point out to you, and you've seen this before, in Australia with our tyranny of distance, we've been working on grains and grazing, canned and dried fruit. But if we go up to intensive horticulture, our profitability increases. It increases the value of farms, the benefits of irrigation, the value of water and national prosperity. So if we're going to develop in the north, we need new roads and ports and move into intensive horticulture and have quick access to the growing markets in Asia and in Australia for that matter. So here are the projects I've been thinking. I want to talk to you about the Fitzroy River, huge possibilities for irrigation in that area. The Ord and the Victoria Rivers, we're only to develop the Ord but the Victoria is there. We've got the Daly and the Roper, we've got the Gulf Rivers and we've got the Flinders River Inland Diversion. We've got possibilities for Clarence, and further development of the snowy. So there's a lot we can do on water projects. Now, one of the first things we've got to do is to integrate these areas in the north with Australia. Now, I was just up in Broome and Fitzroy Crossing, and I was meeting a lot of people up there, and, they, and, and it's a great, great spot in the, this time of the year for the caravanners. All the wrinklies from down south get on there. <laughs> And you meet them, you know. It's amazing walking down the street saying hi. 
<laughs> some of the wrinklies have been. But anyway, but the wrinklies that are in Broome have got there by going all around that route and then coming in from Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne or coming that way into Perth and going up the Coast Road or coming in and going up that road. So it's a long way around. And yet, believe it or not, um, the population of Broome in, the, in that sort of uh, our winter increases by about three times. There are about 40,000 people in a drive a turn up with caravans and, and in that part of the world, and they've come that way. But that also means that there's very little possibility of people growing crops in that area and selling them in the markets in uh, Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane. There's just no access to those markets at all. So I've been looking at this, and this is the Tammany Desert there, and there's a dirt road there. Now, it'll be terribly, and it's all Aboriginal country, and Aboriginals are right in large numbers. Now, rather than giving Aboriginals the dole, I'd put them to work on driving bulldozers and graders and, and putting in the necessary culverts and bridges, uh, crushing rock at the granites and, and, and putting it on the uh, crushed rock on the roads and sealing the roads. We could, uh, using Aboriginal labour, virtually all the way, from Broken Hill, Udna Data, up to Alice Springs and to Halls Creek there, that entire road could be built by Aboriginal labour. It's far better than sit-down money. And they'd be proud to do it. That's the important thing. And that would then mean an enormous amount to the development of that area. At the present moment, because of the problem of state rights and state sovereignty, and <laughs> you can see that there's a queen, the, um, the border between Western Australia and there, and this is the government of Perth, I checked on all the possibilities for development up here and checking to the, with the public servants and what have you. It is effectively directed from Perth and there's no way the Western Australian government would want to see that area become integrated economically with South East Australia. In other words, as soon as I start to talk about this, there could be objections from Perth <laughs> and saying that's their country and they don't want those goods to go south that way. But now, as far as I'm concerned, the federal government, if you're looking at the, the situation from the point of view of the nation, a road like that is a first-class way of making a major inro inroad. <laughs> uh, and stimulating new development up there, not only in, in agriculture but in mining and, or, and tourism and so on. And the same thing applies up here. The Queensland government have developed, sorry, <coughs> the Queensland government have developed Queensland with a view to using Queensland ports and so the major north-south connections are up and down the coast and they provided these east-west roads. And uh, I have been proposing some of these roads for a while and running into opposition from the Queensland government. And basically, I'm saying we could have a new port up there at Weeper and can come down here and we can bring produce all the way uh, into Melbourne and Sydney. Now I've looked at various projects up in here, and particularly on the uh, in, in, the, in that area there. Uh, I've visited places where farmers were growing crops uh, from uh, artesian bore water, and there's a whole range of crops they could grow. And the trouble was they'd grow the crops, and then the crops would just sort of die on the land because there's no way I could get them to market. And the problem was getting the produce to market. But uh, it was up in this part of the world, where they have the road trains, you have one driver and, and, and a, 
uh, four huge trailers behind him. If we, if we provided a road system through there for road trains, the traffic could be enormous. So there's great potential to develop the north by putting in the roads. And once again, that's the sort of thing we can do with the Aboriginal community. And, uh, and at the present moment in Queensland, one of the problems in dealing with the Aboriginal community is the sacred sites. And the Queensland roads, main roads department in Queensland, I was told they had employed a consultant to advise them on the location of sacred sites so they could work out where the roads should go. And the whole thing uh, had an air of unreality about it. And it's about time we faced up to the fact that the best thing to do is to give the people jobs and put them to work and forget about this sit-down money and all the trouble that it causes. So, in the north, you've all heard about the Ord Irrigation Project and the Big Lake Argyle and doing very well. Once again, problem of access to markets. But we go over here on the Victoria River and there's huge potential over there as well. And there are vast areas of irrigation that can be developed from the Victoria River. And if these are developed together, they justify uh, a, a much greater and better transport resources. You can imagine that if, if you've got uh, an irrigation project like that, that'll justify a certain level of transport. But if you have all of this added together, it immediately makes the greater need for transport services, for road and rail. And in this I've shown a connection, a rail connection to the new Alice Darwin Railroad. But the, you need the road first. Now, Here's the Fitzroy. Now, the Fitzroy, and I was here at Fitzroy Crossing, a huge catchment, uh, that is a total flow of 9,000 uh, gigalitres per annum. And so, and, and it, it's comparable with the total water use, rainfall and everything else in the Murray-Darling Basin. So it's got a huge potential up there, totally uh, undeveloped. And there is potential for large dams, and beautiful dam sites on the Margaret River and the uh, other rivers up there, the Leopold, and vast areas that can be developed for irrigation downstream. Enormous potential. And here's one of the gorges. It's just dying for a dam, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there you are. And one of the other, there's a series of rivers that flow into the and I've been thinking of a group of dams up there and pipeline that we could bring additional water down to the Murray-Darling Basin and into the Darling River. And it could be economic. And, but the point is, is that it's going through other country, through here, which is also has great potential for irrigation. So any water that's got there has got to run the economic hurdle of other, other uses on the way past. And here's one of the, uh, the Queensland government have told me very firmly, there's no way I can use that dam site because it's a national park. Uh, 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 nobody ever goes there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you've seen this before, I think I saw it around the wall. So I won't discuss it uh, much more. I'm just saying there is this sort of potential for new development in Australia, and uh, depending on the way we look at it. Here's another one. Uh, you see, this is a common carrier railroad. Now, the critical point here is common carrier. What happened over here in the, in the West is that the various mining companies, I was just up in Port Hedland a couple of months ago, the various mining companies have put in their railroads, which are railroads for the individual company. And the agreement with the Western Australian government is that if these, these uh, uh, mining companies put in their own railroads, the Western Australian government would not build a competitive 
the state government railroad. So they were deliberately excluded. And I'm saying, well, that's absolutely true. There's all these mining companies down here and we've got existing rail systems. We want to put that right through. But the Western Australian government have told me that they would not agree to anybody putting that in because of the agreements with the mining companies that there is no competition. We talk about national competition policy. <laughs> so here's the Murray-Darling Basin, and uh, I'm going to just say a few words about that. And as you know, people are now, and various environmentalists in particular, standing on their platforms and saying that the Murray River is dying, and the Darling's dying, and, and there's terrible calamities occurring, environmental catastrophes in the Murray-Darling Basin. Well, we've got to look at the facts. And first of all, the Murray-Darling Basin supports agriculture of that magnitude, manufacturing based on agriculture, 1.8 million people. And if you speak to the 1.8 million people, you get a different answer than when you speak to the environmentalists in Melbourne, Sydney, and Canberra. And so here's one of my proposals uh, for a inland diversion from the Clarence as a pump storage system. That would be economic, and particularly if it fitted in with the uh, further development of the Australian electricity system, which I want to talk about. And here's another thing. One of the problems with uh, state rights is that, uh, for example, in, in all the green there are the canals, the irrigation canals, you see? And one of the problems with the state rights is that um, Victoria took the view that all of these people uh, should use uh, Melbourne as a port, uh, but the Murray River was through there, and the, the New South Wales government said that they can't put their five foot three inch rail tracks over the border into New South Wales. And the government in Sydney said that all of these people in New South Wales should be sending their freight to Sydney. But if you have a look at it, there's an existing railroad through there to Oyen and another railroad going through to Hay and what have you. It wouldn't take much of an effort to put a connection there. And that would be a far better east-west route than the present route through Broken Hill. There's nothing up there. And the rail route, the railroad route from Sydney uh, to the west went through Broken Hill simply because the people in Broken Hill demanded it and they had a fair bit of political clout. And so that's where the present railroad is. This is a much more sensible route and it picks up a lot of freight and a greater, much greater population. That's a sensible and logical thing to do. Uh, the there is a problem. It involves New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia. Let's talk about the Murray Darling Basin. We've got a potential to double the volume of output for the same volume of water. We use the water very inefficiently. It requires redesign and rebuilding of irrigation systems and opening up of new lands. Well, the point is the whole system was designed 50 and 80 years ago sort of thing. Potential to correct wetland salinity and correct uh, river degradation requires national planning for the basin as a whole and the increased values of water and increased uses and profitability flow from improved transport. In other words, if you improve the transport, you open up markets, the farmers have more money, they're prepared to pay a bit more for the water and they're more efficient in the use of it. But they've run into the environment passion and it's terribly important that you understand the logic of all of this. Environmental activism has become a religion. Okay? Believers are not constrained by the needs for logic or scientific accuracy because their hearts are pure. <laughs> you get the idea? 
If your heart is pure, you can lie like a trooper. <laughs> All others are judged impure and motivated by vested interests. Whenever I talk about uh, any of the projects I've been talking to you about today, the various environmentalists try to work out what my vested interests are. What's my angle? Who's paying me? <laughs> the environmental activists feel blessed when they stop anything and they don't agree on any rational problem solving. As a result, governments are intimidated. There's no common ground for analysis or action and the media stir the pot. The scientists and the engineers stand silent because they don't want to be accused of impurity or lack of environmental faith. And I say this to some of my colleagues, gee whiz, why didn't you say something about it? Oh no. They, 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 they'd be cursed with environmental impurity. <laughs> but that leaves the field open for arrogant leaders of the environmental fashion. They see the weaknesses and exploit them. And the media are part of it. The media love these uh, environmental activists who put their hand on their heart and they defend the environment. And whether it's logical or not, the media don't care. Because, you know, they're speaking from the heart. And it makes it terribly uh, difficult to have a logical discussion with them. And this is the problem. So I'll show you some of the little elements of truth that have been quietly ignored in these environmental discussions about the uh, Murray River, for example. Now, remember Sturt? He travelled down the Murrumbidgee and the Murray and to the mouth. Remember him? And, and uh, he was a surveyor general in New South Wales and they carried a whale boat in, part, in bits up over the Blue Mountains and they put it into the Murrumbidgee and they sailed the whale boat and rode all the way down the Murrumbidgee to the Murray, to the mouth of the Murray. When they got to the mouth of the Murray it was blocked by sand. The other day there was an environmentalist on the ABC telly saying that the mouth of the Murray has been blocked and it's an environmental catastrophe. Well it was blocked in 1829. <laughs> okay, and here's the map that Sturt made of the mouth of the Murray. And because they couldn't get their whale boat out through there, they had to row all the way back up the Murray and Murrumbidgee and it's a great epic of endurance in Australian history, a fantastic thing that they did. So here we have the environmentalists claiming that the sandbar at the mouth of the Murray is an environmental disaster. The sandbar was there when Sturt discovered the mouth of the Murray in 1829-30. So much for that. They also say that the uh, Murray River is dying. Well, here's Ron East, a dear friend of mine from way back, um, standing astride the Murray River <laughs> at Echuca in the drought in 1923. The Murray River also dried up like this in the droughts of 1913 and 14 and 1929 and before 1913. So the people along the Murray were accustomed in severe droughts for the Murray River to dry up. And there, you see that there? That's the Murray River. <laughs> you see? And all the bed there is dry. And that's it, Echuca. And the environmentalists now say and put their hands on their heart, the Murray River is dying. Well, <laughs> you were stone dead then. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> the Hume Dam and later the Snowy Scheme were built to ensure that the river did not dry up again. And now we're in the middle of a big drought and the river is virtually up to the brim. So we've achieved our design objective of providing water through the worst droughts. And 
the main storage of the snowy scheme had to be to be down. I know they've now renamed it to you campaign, but when I was working on the design of it, it was Adam Inaby, <laughs> was designed to provide secure flows over a seven year period of drought. So we deliberately designed Hume Dam and the Snowy Scheme to make sure that the Snowy River didn't dry up. And now it's full of water and people are saying it's dying. Well, there's Hume Dam. And it looks all right, doesn't it? And there's Eucumbin Dam. And there's Gattaca in the Snowy Scheme. Okay. Oh, is that? What's happening? Ah, now, another environmental thing. Do you remember when they uh, privatised the State Electricity Commission of Victoria? Uh, the Victorian government thought this was absolutely terrific. And so they said, we'll privatise the lot. We'll sell off the generating plant and the and the transmission lines and the, or, uh, and the retail system, and so they brought in various entrepreneurs, American companies mainly, and they got about 35 or 40 billion dollars for the State Electricity Commission of Victoria. Uh, there was an immediate problem because the, uh, the people who wanted to buy it paid too much, and so the Victorian government then entered into various guarantees to make sure that these people that paid these high prices uh, were unable to get an income to justify their huge investment. And one of the things they did was that to guarantee uh, minimum prices uh, for, say, the sale of power to the Portland smelter. And so they, were, they in, in effect, uh, underwrote <coughs> uh, the power charges so that these <coughs> new generators, the new Loyang and all the rest of them, they had <coughs> an, an assured income uh, from the sale of power. And then along, but they find that the Snowy Scheme <coughs> is based on different economics. The Snowy Scheme is hydroelectric power and the rain continues to fall. And uh, the Snowy Scheme, the Eucumbin Dam and Gattaca and all the tunnels that I worked on in the underground power station, they'll last 100 or 200 years and more. And, and they were, in normal circumstances, there you uh, pay them off, amortise them, you pay off all the interest in, the, say, the first 40 or 50 years of operation. Well, the Snowy Scheme has, has just had its... Uh, you know, a few years ago it had its 50th year since the beginning of the scheme. And so the Snowy Mountain scheme in terms of the capital cost. The capital cost of the scheme has been largely paid off by the returns on the uh, electricity to date and, and the <coughs> uh, value of the water that was transferred inland. So in effect, the Snowy scheme has already paid for itself many times over. <coughs> it's now going to continue to operate for another 100 years and more. And from, that, from now on then, the electricity is virtually fruit on the sideboard. It's low cost. And that's the reason why you build hydroelectric streams for low cost, permanent, if you like, environmentally friendly electricity. And this is what happened to all the hydroelectric power stations around the world. They're all generating low costs. When I was with the Hydro in Tasmania, we had an interesting situation where uh, one of our power stations had finished 50 years. We were uh, uh, or 40. We paid them off over 45 years. <coughs> we were then ready to, uh, if you like, uh, capitalise on that, and we were able to reduce our power charges because we had another power station coming off the scheme on which we didn't have to pay further interest money. The federal government were furious. And they told Tasmania uh, that we weren't uh, charging uh, what Tasmania, uh, the revenue that Tasmania could get from the hydro system in Tasmania. And besides that, we were complaining, we were competing unfairly uh, with, with thermal power in Victoria. And, and, th and they were trying to establish the Portland smelter. And they said that the continued low cost hydro power 
from Tasmania was competing unfairly with the higher cost thermal power in Victoria. Okay. That was a few years ago, but now this is recently. So the air is a snowy, generating low cost electricity. And and the guys that were on the you know, in the control room in the snowy and doing all the day to day <coughs> uh, planning of pricing and everything else. They were selling power to the Portland smelter at a lower cost than the Victorian <laughs> government's guaranteed minimum. And that meant that every time the Snowy sold power to uh, the <coughs> in, into the grid like that, uh, the Victorian government ha had, to, had to top up the difference be because of their price guarantees to the smelter. So the Victorian government got very angry about this. Yes. Oh, thank you. And so, uh, anyway, the Victorian government uh, got upset and they spoke to the New South Wales government and they said, we can't allow this to happen. The Snowy scheme competing unfairly with our privatised thermal generators. So what happened is that the treasurers of Victoria and New South Wales got together and arranged an environmental inquiry in New South Wales. And they then orchestrated the environmentalists so that the environmentalists went, uh, went along to this uh, environmental inquiry in New South Wales. It was made to look like a royal commission. It was quite a disaster. And the environmentalists were encouraged to sing their song about diverting water down, down the Snowy River. They were and the treasurers of Victoria and New South Wales were simply trying to reduce the power output of the Snowy and to force recapitalisation. So one of the things, they arranged an environmental inquiry and they agreed to divert water down the, some water down the Snowy River and Brack says it's one of the most important things he's ever done in his life. It's exactly the opposite. But anyway, so they agreed to do that. There was another trick to the system. And that was to recapitalise the scheme. Now the Snowy scheme had already been bought and paid for by the people of Australia. And the Victorian government, the New South Wales government and the federal government agreed that they'll have to pay for it all over again. And by making the people pay for it all over again, you can then add those interest charges into the power cost to the Snowy scheme. So whereas the Snowy scheme was in a, in a position to uh, uh, offer, say, electricity at uh, uh, three cents a kilowatt hour, the federal government uh, made them, uh, uh, if you like, uh, refinance the scheme. They had to borrow the entire money again and, and, and put the interest charges on the bills so the power charges, say, went up from three cents a kilowatt hour to four and a half cents a, a kilowatt hour, just to pay all the interest bills. And that had stopped this nasty competition with the private uh, generators. So that's the real basis of all the environmental talk about the Snowy Scheme. I'm amazed at the way uh, the ABC and the others never pick it up. It's always denied, but this is what's happened. It was started in 1949, it was completed in 1975. It was the only national public infrastructure project in the history of the nation. It promises to be the last. It, I said this and that is largely amortised with a hundred years. The benefits of low cost, eh? they claim unfair composition. Their proposals was to refinance the scheme by privatisation or corporatisation to reduce the electrical output by throwing water down the Snowy River, to reduce inland diversion, and they did that at a time just before a big drought, and nobody's objecting. And what was worse, they then agreed in the Victorian and New South Wales, they would lock these arrangements in place for 75 years. They locked them in place. You could, now, you know, a later government can change it anyway, but by locking it in place, that was an effectively a guarantee to the private power generators. Now, the reason why they had to do that 
is that the private generators who are now say the Lu Yang people, they won't invest in new thermal power stations unless they have a long term guarantee. Now, as I've pointed out, the snowy scheme has a hundred plus year life. The thermal power stations like Lu Yang have a life of about 35 years. Because the, well, the, the furnaces and the boiler plant effectively burn out and you have to replace them. And it could be that you might even want to change the site in order to be closer to a new mine development or something like that. OK, right. So anyway, so these thermal power stations, now, uh, this is the coming problem in Australia. You know the way they've had electricity crises in, in, in California, in America, and in, 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 and in Europe? And, and the whole problem is this is with privatised power, nobody wants to build the next new power station until it's absolutely necessary. So there are going to be, from now on, every time there's a need for a new thermal power station to be built, the investors will wait until it's absolutely necessary before they start really committing the big money to it. And so this was one of the other problems that was caused. And so in effect the Snowy was tending to inhibit new investment in new thermal power. So that's what they did. So they locked the arrangements in place for 75 years and then blamed it on the environmentalists. And of course the environmental is who pleased to take responsibility. <laughs> so it'll be revisited, inevitably, because it's a problem that is not being solved that way. Because there is continuing growth in electricity in Australia, and somebody has to build the new power stations, and they've got to be funded. And I can't see how the present privatised system is going to meet those needs. So, the, oh, well, I'm just repeating the benefit. I'm pointing out here that the Snowy scheme, which has already been bought and paid for, if it was privatised, you can put any price you like on it from 16 to about $40 billion. And I, I, I'll leave that for another time. So here it is. The decisions by Victoria and New South Wales are a very sad commentary on the state of government. There is a national economy, and the attacks on the Snowy Scheme make it evident that the state governments are determined to undermine any attempt by the Australian government to manage the national economy or to plan and build for the nation. It's grim. There we are. When you look at Australia from space, we're all one country. Uh, we've talked about the global economy, and we've talked about the opportunities in Australia. And the question is, how on earth are we going to get on with the job? And this is what this is all about. Whose responsibility? Now, it's useful to go back a uh, hundred years to the time of the Constitution. A hundred years ago, the states of Australia, as I explained, were individual countries with their own port and rail system. They had these state capitals, and, you, and Australia was a wealthy country, you know. You've got to look at the uh, parliamentary buildings in, in Victoria and then in these other state capitals. They, they're, uh, th they're the public buildings of a wealthy country and a wealthy nation. And each, each, um, each state was self-sufficient. And, and they really didn't do much business with one another. In Victoria, all the produce would go out from Melbourne. And the same thing would apply in, in South Australia from the wheat fields up in here. And each state developed their own rail system. You can see the green there in Victoria, the, um, uh, the, f the five foot three inch gauge. And the, and the red up in here in Queensland is three foot six. And over in Western Australia it was three foot six. 
And in New South Wales, it was the standard gauge of four foot eight and a half. So, uh, they, and so at the time they wrote the constitution, there are individual ports and individual rail systems. The rail systems couldn't join up because they had different gauges. And at the time of the constitution, that didn't worry them. They thought that was a good thing. It preserved the state sovereignty, the independence of the states. And so the constitution was deliberately written so that each state considered, continued uh, to maintain its own economic sovereignty, its own transport systems and rail uh, and ports and all the rest of it. Each state was, if you like, responsible for its own destiny. The federal government was only given the powers for things like uh, overseas trade, and, and defence and foreign affairs. And the object was that they weren't to interfere in any way with state rights. And we got through to the Second World War before there was much of a hiccup in that. And in the Second World War, they agreed to what was called uniform taxation. Up until the Second World War, the individual states of Australia collected their own income taxes and in effect from those they gave uh, uh, revenue to the federal government. But during the war they decided it'd be more efficient if the federal government uh, became responsible and they adopted uniform taxation which was uh, similar taxation rates for everybody in Australia regardless of where they lived. So they got away from individual state taxation and that was only in the Second World War. But Australia developed like this. You've got to remember, it wasn't you know, a little over 100 years ago, uh, in Victoria, for example, we had our own navy. And it sunk at uh, Black Rock. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and the yachties go around it. You can't, doesn't, that doesn't turn it over. <laughs> and so, if you talk to people about the... Uh, if you like, the organisation chart for the management of Australia, they immediately think of something like that, the same as BHP or Rio Tinto or any other company. But in actual fact, it's like that. It's upside down. The, the warring tribes. You get the idea? And there they are, and the federal government only has powers that are allocated by constitutional referendum. They thought they were pretty smart just a few years ago and they found they could get into international treaties. And if the federal government got into international treaties and say, in that case, the first case for the environment, that gave them the authority to interfere in Tasmania. And now the states are worried that the federal government could enter into all sorts of treaties on, on, on labour or human rights or you name it. It's a, and this could immediately result in the federal government telling the states what to do. So there's great apprehension about that. But the warring tribes retained powers for state revenues and expenditure, health and education, criminal and company law, water, land transport, farming, mining, manufacturing, energy, and public works. Now, at the present moment, we're having a great fight say about health funding. Now the important thing there is that by according to the constitution it is the state governments that have the constitutional responsibilities for health. And uh, when you read all the newspaper reports and everything else, uh, uh, Tony Abbott <laughs> responsible for health. And, and, and he's got an impossible position because he's trying to create a national health system in circumstances where the constitutional responsibilities reside at state level. So he's not going to do very well. And these are the things that, you see, powers are granted for defence. Howard's having a wonderful time at the moment uh, because of the defence issues, you see. They're things that the feds have, the fed, federal government is responsible for defence, so therefore Howard can, can sort of have a lot of exposure uh, to the public and publicity 
on talking on defence issues. External affairs and trade, quarantine, naturalisation, and they're the things, you see. And <laughs> that's an interesting thing that was written into the Constitution. The Australian government is responsible for the preservation of state rights. <laughs> OK? So you've already seen this. And as I pointed out, when the Second World War came along, the state premiers demanded an equal share of the defence resources. Now, this constitution causes a great deal of costs and problems. The concept of separate and competing state economies is locked in. We face national challenges. The states are abandoning responsibility for state infrastructure. They're liquidating public utilities and public assets. Now, let's talk about this. Uh, in the way the constitution, in the way the system was working, and the federal government was collecting revenues and then allocating monies to the states and so on, the states were complaining they didn't get enough. So a few years ago, John Cain, as premier in Victoria, decided he had to increase the Victorian budget because they wanted to do all sorts of good works in health and education and schools and things like that and hospitals. So John Cain leased off the trams. And what he did was, in effect, uh, uh, sold the trams to an Austrian outfit and then bought them back uh, uh, by time payment. That immediately gave a cash injection to the Victoria and, and Cain was then able to use that as a capital sum to do his good works. Now, you can imagine the way the federal treasury and the federal government reacted to that. It was absolutely outrageous. They're sort of flogging off the trams just in order to get cash to spend. It's just take, taking the trams to the local pawnbroker or the cash converter. Uh, but then it became worse, and the Kennett government came to power and they, started, and they got on to this business of privatising the electricity system. And they got $40 billion from the sale of the electricity system. Once again, cash. The fact was, of course, that there wasn't much debt associated with that because it had been publicly funded for years. Uh, uh, and the SEC used to offer bonds and, and so on. And, and the superannuation funds and, and so on. They were always buying border works bonds and SEC bonds. And so we had this wonderful business where the superannuation funds invested in public infrastructure. But the state government wanted the cash. And when they got the cash, they had to pay off all of these bonds, you see. So all of a sudden, the super funds got their money back and they had to invest on the stock exchange. And this was a device, if you like, of also increasing the prices of assets on the stock exchange. So it was all rather scandalous. And so the Constitution imposes a great burden of costs on the Australian community, the repeated duplication of activities from state to state. That is the terrible thing. You know, they have separate company laws, they have separate this and that. Criminal law. Why should the criminal law be different in every state of Australia? And it leads to extra costs amounting to tens of billions of dollars a year and employs a large number of public servants who think that's a good scheme. Expertise at the national level. In order to avoid confrontation with the states, the federal government has deliberately chosen not to have any professional expertise in matters regarding the state rights. The various public servants employed in those areas in the federal government are political apparatchiks who know very little, and their, their, their main purpose is to write difficult letters to the state governments who spend an equal time in writing difficult letters back. Uh, one area is electricity. There's a national grid and the management is firmly in the hands of the states. Now there is water. So the, I'll tell you something later on about the, I'll tell you now. 
On one occasion, I was saying a few things about the Great Artesian Basin. And the Prime Minister's wife managed to get up into Queensland, quoting Lance Endersby on what he was saying on the Great Artesian Basin. And the Queensland government told the Prime Minister that water was a state responsibility and he had to take his wife home and keep her there. <laughs> now, in science policies, there are no national science policies. You can see that. There are federal government science policies. The chief of scientists, the innovation is directed to the federal. The states insist that the federal government avoid science matters in areas of state rights. And there's an intellectual blockade. So the politics of the Great Artesian Basin. There it is, the Great Artesian Basin, Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia and the Northern Territory, and it's the responsibility of state governments. There's no way you can look at that from a national perspective. Another project. There's no way the states should allow projects like that. But now, there's an interesting thing. The various states are growing at different rates. And in this, I've tried to demonstrate that older industrial Australia, which has the larger population and the big clout politically, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania, and the ACT, is actually declining in total share of population and GD, gross state product and electricity consumption. And the newer states, Queensland and West Australia in particular, are growing and growing in population. So we have a situation where Queensland and New South Wales are now challenging older industrial Australia. And that's where the new growth is. And, and it also means that a, a sensible investment of national income is in the growth. On the other hand, the pressure from New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania and the ACT is for the federal government to direct monies, infrastructure monies and other monies, to the states to help prop up the decline, if you like. You get the idea? To, to arrest the decline by investing there, whereas the sensible thing to do is to invest in the growth. But that is a subtlety that's... Now, so this, these are the fashionable responses of the state governments. Much less public investment in infrastructure, in maintenance, long-term planning, larger allocations for social welfare. You see, in other words, we're not earning our living. Increased taxes, taxation becoming a major factor. Um, it's amazing the extent to which everybody is consumed with taxation in the private sector. You think, think to people, managers in the private sector, their major concern very often is how do they manage their affairs to reduce their taxation? And, and it in, involves a lot of time in the private sector dodging taxation. Not dodging it so much, it's, it's trying to cope with it. There are deficits in government budgets and the sale of public assets. There's a reduction in gold reserves. We sold off our gold. And here's the other thing that's happening. Encouragement of gambling as a tax resource. The state government thinks it's absolutely wonderful. All the money they get from the Crown Casino. Encouragement of sport as an economic activity. And acceptance of popular art and religious uh, rigorous education. Neglect of technical education. They closed all the junior technical schools in Victoria. So uh, here is the government revenues from privatisations. Now, the main reason to show you this is that in, in Australian dollars, Australia, New Zealand, Hungary, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, we're in good company. And if you have a look at it on a per capita basis, Australia leads the world in government revenue from privatisation sales. We're flogged off our assets to, for cash. And we're the grand champions in sale of public assets. Now, the incredible thing is that if there's no more assets to sell, things are going to get pretty crook. 
And so the growth in Australia is predominantly in services. But our trade depends on production and our external liabilities are growing. So what has actually happened is that we've flogged off all our assets, we've flogged off the SEC and the Commonwealth Bank and uh, Telstra, bits of Telstra, you name it, all of those things, sold all those public assets and spent the money on services. In the meantime, production has declined as a proportion of our gross domestic product. And that means the national overhead. If we think of all the services as an overhead on production, it means our national overhead has just increased steadily over the years. I, I, I drew that several years ago. It, it, it's, if I brought it up to date, it would look worse. Uh, now, let's just go through these one after the other. The privatisation of public utilities was a sale to private overseas investors of public assets in Australia. It created an overseas indebtedness borne by all Australians. So this is something. You see, when the Victorian government sold off the State Electricity Commission, and that was bought by a US corporations, say, or US corporations, plural, that created a debt of all Australians. So the Victorian government was pretty cute and in effect it removed a state government debt to everybody else in Australia. The pension funds were forced to transfer these funds to other investments. We won the world record. It was a one-off cash gain raised entirely without taxation. Government used the funds to gain uh, fund increases in the services economy and they created unsustainable expectations. We can't afford to continue to pay those. The increased funds led to increases in share values, property values and salaries and the financial services sector. Not only did the stock market go up, the residential property market is up sky high in Sydney and Melbourne and people are paying a billion, a million dollars for a house these days. And what is absolutely amazing is that the banks are lending them something like 80% of the asset value. So you can go around it and uh, as a young couple, you can go and buy a house worth a million dollars and a bank will give you $800,000. What happens when the property value drops to $600,000? Because it was a one-off capital gain, there will be a serious correction. In the end, it will be found that the people were defrauded by their own governments. Now, this is the sad thing. And I trace it all back to the Constitution and the fact that nobody's in charge of the national economy. If nobody's in charge, the thugs take over. And that's what's happened. The thugs have taken over, sold off the assets to the cash converters, and spent the money. It's terribly serious. You've already seen that. So here are the solutions. Recognise the reality of the enormous problems in many countries, the potential of Australia. Recognise the reality of the constitutional blockage. I've got a light blockage now. Um, and plan for a change in the constitution. And recognise that long-term investment by the private sector is critically dependent on long-term plans by governments. There you see it there and recognise that governments can create so much sovereign risk that even governments can become unable to think constructively about future development. That is the point we're in at the moment. I'm finding that governments have lost the ability to plan and build for the future. They just don't know how to do it anymore. So there we are. Okay. Not state versus state. There are common national problems and uh, uh, leadership requires professional competence. Yeah, what's the next one? Okay, here are proposed new responsibilities. National company laws. That's reasonable, isn't it? National occupation, health and safety. National criminal code to create a Department of National Development. National electricity, national gas, national oil. Return snowy. Yeah. 
energy security, on water, national planning for water conservation. The federal government doesn't have the power to plan for the nation in our water use. We, we need to put that under new management, this road transport. Why can't the federal government plan and build national roads? Planning and building development roads for national development. Rail transport, we've already been talking about that. A construction authority. I want to create a construction authority, and as, as I could use people effectively to that. National pioneer teams. I'd like to, this is where I'd like to use the Aborigines. Get on with an age group like that, train them to get on with the job. Well, there it is. You see, we've got a constitution that's blocked the system, it's not working, and the reason is nobody is responsible. Well, there it is. Now, when the settlers first came to Australia, they found groups of mound springs. Here, little springs dotted around there. And these mound springs, they'd been there for millions of years. And these mound, I'll show you some pictures of some of these. And they had their own flora and fauna. Uh, you know, a group of mound springs there might have their own unique uh, snails and crustaceans. Uh, their own unique fish. They have the, these, these, uh, some of these areas have uh, fish without eyes. They have fish that can live in sort of hot and boiling water almost. Quite incredible. And so there is a unique flora and fauna at every one of these, and they are all developed over millions of years, and there is a, if you like, a steady flow of, of water, just quiet, steady flow of water. And the early settlers found these isolated mound springs, and the invasion, particularly the animals, alarmed the Aborigines. And of course, the Aborigines were defending their water supply, and they had these blessed sheep and cattle coming in and trampling all around the edges and destroying the vegetation and, and making a mess of the whole thing. And the Aboriginals started to shoot the, uh, or not, you know, spear the, the, the cattle and the sheep. And the settlers then turned up with their uh, guns and, and, and started to exterminate the Aborigines. So there was an awful fight out in the bush around these main, uh, these mound springs as the, as the settlers tried to, de tried to defend them, their, an their animals from the, the Aborigines and the Aborigines tried to defend their mound springs. You see that crew there of Mound Springs there, that determined the route of the explorer McDowell Stewart when he went from Adelaide through to Darwin. And about 10 years after McDowell Stewart had gone through there, that became the route of the Overland Telegraph. And so the Overland Telegraph, right through to there to Darwin and, uh, and across into uh, Singapore and what have you, that, around about 1880, meant that Australia was connected to the world. We had a Morse code telegraph system and Australia had virtually an instantaneous connection with the world. And in order to do that, they had to build the Overland Telegraph through there and the Mound Springs helped them do it. The construction of the telegraph line from Darwin, from Adelaide, uh, believe it or not, the main bulk of the line was constructed in about two years. Now that meant putting in posts on a telegraph line and stringing the wires, and they did it largely in, uh, in a couple of years or so, and it was these mound springs that enabled them to do it, because they didn't have to cart water all the way uh, to the construction teams. So the mound springs were important in the beginning of Australia. And there's a picture of some of these mound springs. And you can see the reason why they call them mound springs. You see the little mound there? And that's, that's a, a, a sort of salts and uh, stuff that has been deposited from the 
uh, from the waters, and they so the, there's a mound with a little ring of water on the top, and there lot and there's another one there. You see, there's lots of those around Australia, uh, in that area. Now, if I can, can I? Who's running the machine? I can't go back. I guess. Don't worry. You can. Hmm. There we are. Yep. Now the important thing is that the outline of the Great Artesian Basin is there. You see the outline of the Great Artesian Basin drawn in. And so these mound springs are around, mostly around the edge. I just, uh, yeah, just remember that. There they are. And there's one of them, you see, the bubbler spring. Now, one of the reasons for the mound springs is that Australia had a long history of volcanism. And you see these black areas there? They're all the lava fields. Now, here in Victoria, you know, you see, you know Mount Macedon there? All these lava fields over there. And so there's these great lava fields all the way through there. There's a site of, there they are again, in the volcanoes. And remember, remember Mount Gambier over here somewhere? There about. Uh, uh, you know, the thing at Mount Gambier, that, um, th uh, that volcano there was in, uh, uh, operating 4,500 years ago, not very long ago. And so there's this great history of volcanism in Australia. And so these water of the mound springs is associated with the water that comes up and the steam that comes up with volcanoes. And there's the volcanoes in, in eastern Victoria, western Victoria. There's really, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of them. You never knew they were there, did you? Can you remove that thing? And there's the Queensland volcanoes. Okay. Oh, it's gone. Now it's now gone. And there's the. Uh, how many of you have seen the Glasshouse Mountains in Queensland? There we are. Well, you see this thing here. Golly. There it is. There's one, look, you see? Uh, and there's the Glasshouse Mountains. The Glasshouse Mountains. So, so now you get the picture now. We had the Mound Springs. And we had the volcanism earlier. And then the settlers came along. And the drilling of deep bores began in 1884. And uh, by the end of... Uh, does this need a new battery? Looks like it, anyway. Have you got a battery for this? No. Anyway. By the end of... Where's Mr. Thick? <laughs> By uh, the end of uh, 1899, 500 wells had been sunk. Now, it's important to get an idea of the huge investment. This is the sort of drilling rig they had to use, and run by a steam engine, you see. They were taking bores down. 4,000, 5,000 feet, some went to 6,000 feet. Can you imagine the investment on a, uh, say, a pastoral station? How they are able to fund a borehole four and 5,000 feet deep? Really quite incredible. This was a very rich time in Australia. And if 500 wells had been sunk by 1899, but by 1895, there was already serious concern about declining flows. Because what happened? They put the bore in, it just squirted like mad, they let it run, and they just watched it die off. And by 1895, there was serious concern about the declining flows. And the bill was passed in the lower house, and it was rejected in the upper house because of the belief that the basin was continually recharged from surface rainfall on exposed strata. So because it was being recharged from surface rainfall, you don't have to worry if the flow is declining. Now, 
I became concerned about this about four years ago, and because I attended a presentation in Charleville in Queensland, where the chairman of the Great Artesian Basin Consultative Council, ah, thank you, uh, the chairman of the Great Artesian Basin Consultative Council, um, gave a presentation on the Great Artesian Basin. This was four years ago. And he was talking about all these declining flows. And I had to say to him, mate, you've got it wrong. And I, I went home and I prepared a paper explaining the source of the waters in the Great Artesian Basin. And uh, this guy, uh, was, you know, he's a farmer, he was most impressed. And I said, look, I'll put it in the academy as a thing. But anyway, what happened was that uh, the Queensland government got to hear about it and got in touch with the academy and told them not to publish what Professor Endersby had said. They're still doing it. Last year in December, I was invited to speak to Greening Australia in Brisbane on my views on the Great Artesian Basin. The Queensland government got in touch with the management of Greening Australia, which is a you know, private foundation uh, trying to do good works in the environment, believe it or not, um, by planting trees. They were quietly told by the uh, Queensland government that if they uh, provided a forum for me at the annual general meeting, where I've been invited to address their annual general meeting, the Queensland government would cut their subsidies from if they proceeded. So they got in touch with me. And I had to say to them, now look, there is absolutely no way you should yield to that. You can't allow them to do that. Even though it might wreck your organisation, you have to stand by certain principles. And you can't allow yourself to be put into a position where the Queensland government just makes a threat to you like that if you listen to this guy, we'll cut off your money. So they said, we'll get back to you. <coughs> and they ring me up and said, OK, we're game. I said, we're on. <laughs> and off we went, and I spoke to this Greening Australia at their annual general meeting. <coughs> and the uh, people involved with the Queensland government uh, let the organisers know that they wanted a right of reply at the end of my talk. They had the right of reply, and they didn't say a word. So, getting back to the Great Artesian Basin. In my studies then of the Great Artesian Basin and how things had gone wrong, one of the things I discovered was a great, wonderful poem by Banjo Patterson. It get, went, was published in the uh, Bulletin, I think at the beginning of 1896, or 1895. Anyway, so here was Banjo Patterson and you're going to have to do a poetry reading with me because the Banjo Patterson poem gave me the clue as to the source of the waters and what actually happened at the time. So let's have a look. And now, you've got to read this through and you've got to work out. And, and, and it has the wonderful romp of Banjo Patterson. The stock have started drying and we're sick of prayers and providence. The derrick up above us, you've seen a picture of the derrick, solid earth. We're waiting for the lever, we're sinking down, deeper down, we'll sink it, and the drill is plugging down and at a thousand feet of level. Now you've got to remember, fantastic investment. They're drilling down a thousand feet, this is in, in the 1890s, and we'll get it from the devil deeper down. But our engines built in Glasgow, so we had steam engines built in Glasgow uh, by a canny Scott. It's 20 horsepower. Now, the, now they brought out the Canadian well drillers. So the well driller is Canadian Bill, and they're sinking deeper down. If we fail to get the water, then it's ruined to the squatter, for the drought is on the station and the weather's getting hotter. You get the drama of it all with Banjo. But the shaft has started caving. So they had, to, they had to case the bore, and the sinking's very slow, and the yellow rods are bending in the water. The tubes are jamming. They burst the end, <laughs> sinking down. The shaft is caving. The tubes are jamming. That's the bore casing. We fight our way to water. 
but there's no artesian water, though we've passed 3,000 feet. Now, this gave me the clue that the sediments were dry. The sediments were dry. They were going through those rocks and there was no water in the sedimentary strata. And the contract price is growing and the boss is nearly beat, but it must be down beneath us. Though so she's bumping on the solid rock 4,000 feet below. So they went through the sediments into the underlying granites and, 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 uh, and bedrock. Sinking down, we're going, and the time they hear is knocking on the roof. You get the idea? And then, but hark! The whistle's blowing with a wild, exultant blast, and the boys are madly cheering. They've struck the flower star. And it's rushing up the tubing from 4,000 feet below. So they struck the water in the bedrock underneath the sediments. Deeper down comes, so there you are. So it clears away and it's let the water run. Uh, that was a problem. It glimmers in how it flashes in the sun. It's flowing, ever flowing, deeper down, further down. Now the stock of, oh, that's reasonable. There we are. So, that's what it's like <laughs> when it gushes. So they took the bores down and they opened it up and there it flowed. Now, the incredible thing is that, and there it is in South Australia. In this case, the thing is horizontal. It's coming out hot, as you can see, steam everywhere, and, and uh, strongly uh, salty and acid waters. And this is the way they used it. They just let it flow over the land and sink into the ground. And uh, if, if you've been to uh, Moree, if you go to Moree, you can have a, uh, uh, a thermal bath in, the, uh, in, in this uh, natural artesian pool. They've got all the, all the warning signs up there. You know, enter the water slowly, uh, continue up the hips. You've got to be careful, it'll kill you. And it cost you thirty dollars an hour for massage therapy and remedial massage. You see? Now look at this. You see? Uh, it contains magnesium, sulfate, calcium, iron, and alumina, silica, ammonia, and nitrates. There we are. So it does you good. And uh, water has a natural temperature of 43 degrees Celsius. Now, you heard about the boiling frog. Do you know about the boiling frog? No. Well, you see, they have to be careful. Enter the water slowly and can only continue up the hips and thing. Huh? If you submerged yourself fully in the water and you tried to swim around, you'd have no internal body frame of reference for the heat and you wouldn't notice the heat until you dropped dead. If you only stay in it up to your knees and your hips, you can feel the, if you like, the cold up here and the hot down there, and you know it's damn hot. If you're fully submerged, you don't notice the heat. So anyway, that's a little, you know, something other. So this is what the Queensland Government says. And this is from the present website of the Queensland Government. And they show the strata there like that, and the water, and they say that the water falls on the rainfall here and continues down there, and you pick it up in these sub-artesian and artesian wells here. This is sub-artesian if you have to use a wind windmill to pump it out, and this is artesian if it flows at the surface. And there's the bedrock and there's the aquifers. Now, when I saw this with this guy, this farmer chap, I said, mate, that's stupid. Now, here's, here's some of these springs in South Australia I was showing you there. That distance from there to there, where the rainfall in Queensland, that distance there is about 1,500 kilometres. The depth here is one and a half kilometres or so. If that was drawn to a natural scale, 
it would be a single line across the page. You see, 1,500 kilometres, one and a half kilometres, it's a ratio of length to thickness of 1,000 to 1. So that, that there, the depth there should be just 1,000th of the distance from there to there, which isn't very much. So I said, look, and that's on, uh, uh, as copied by all school children around Australia. So for three years now, I've been publishing on, on the academy and everything else that the Queensland government is uh, stark raving mad. No, I haven't said that. The Queensland government <laughs> is very foolish <laughs> <laughs> and in showing that thing there. And that's what I like. That is uh, a vertical exaggeration, 87.5 to 1. It shows you what the nature is, but that is still a vertical exaggeration. And let me show you now. If we draw it to a true natural scale, and of course we then have to show the curvature of the Earth, sedimentary start of forming the Great Artesian Basin are just that thin blanket over the top. And, and you know, I, I, that's, that's what the, I had to draw it, I think, as uh, one pixel per kilometre, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But you can see, to think that you can have rainfall coming here and it goes all along that little thing there, all the way, and pops out of the ground back there, it's absolutely, you know, it's just not on. And so that is, that is the reality. But the Queensland government produces this diagram and they declare these are the intake areas here and they then draw these imaginary lines through here saying the way the water flows through the Great Artesian Basin and they say the Great Artesian Basin is recharging from rainfall in that area there. Okay, and what is worse is that they have declared that in, in the year 2000 because of what I've been saying about the thing being nonsense. The Queensland government just approved their point of view, brought in legislation and they declared that land there, that sort of orangey coloured land, they declared that as the official recharge area and that got away from industry scientific objections you see because the water was told where it had to go. Now, this is from the Western Mining Corporation who are using artesian waters in South Australia uh, to, for their mineral processing plant at uh, Roxby Downs, you know, the uranium, uranium mine. And that's from the web pages of the Western Mining Corporation relating to the use of bore water to supply the mineral processing plant. Now the diagram says recharge from rainfall in Queensland. This is Western Mining saying recharge from rainfall in Queensland. The distance from there back to the recharge areas is about 1500 kilometres and there's virtually no difference in elevation. So the waters come all the way from Queensland percolating through the sandstones and squirts out of the ground here uh, without any, any loss of head and to come 1,500 kilometres. Well, I don't want to say anything, but I don't own any shares in Western Mining Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so over the years, this is what's happened. The, there's been a huge number of non-flowing bores. They've just been drying up and you can see the flowing bores. And there's petroleum bores as well. And they're in the middle of the same area. Now the release of methane was associated with a large number of the early deep boreholes. When, you know, in, in the 1890s, one of their troubles was there's so much methane there that the water came up just like a white emulsion filled with natural gas. And that was a damn nuisance. So they had to allow the uh, um, bore water to stand for a while and for the natural gas to dissipate. 
After a while, they got a bit cute, and they used to collect the natural gas in containers on the top of the well, wells, and then they'd flare it at night so that the stock could find their way around to keep on drinking the bore water at night. And they used it as a basis for mustering. And in 1914, the government geologist in Queensland noted that people were not interested in looking for intake beds for petroleum. But he was immediately cast aside as a dangerous radical. Now, here's the sort of thing that happens. Here's natural gas at the kitchen tap in a farm in Minnesota. The farmer got water and gas from his water bore, and the gas had to be flared off. If he didn't flare off his gas, his hot water tank would have exploded. Now, this is what's happened. The discharge from the Great Artesian Basin reached a maximum in about 1917. It's been declining ever since. Then, now I want to tell you about this chap. John Walter Gregory. Uh, he was appointed to the University of Melbourne in 1899. He studied in the evening at the London Mechanics Institute, a self-taught guy almost. He was appointed assistant in geology at the British Museum in 1887. He went to London University, got a BSc with first class honours, Doctor of Science in 1893, and he was involved in field studies in the Rocky Mountains and so on. He went through an expedition into, into Kenya, studied the lava fields. He named the Rift Valley the Great Rift Valley. He published a book, The Great Rift Valley, and so on. And then in December 1999, he was appointed Professor of Geology at the University of Melbourne. And in the summer of 19, he took a, an expedition of students by camel, and they uh, went up the line, they, they saw the mound springs going up to Uden the Data, and they went up that way, and here he is, mounted on his camels, so his baggage camels. The daring expedition of the young Scottish professor uh, caused much interest in the press. They had a cartoon in the bulletin with him sitting on a camel with his kilt on. And here he, he went to the Great Rift Valley in Kenya. Just look at all the pelicans there, see them there? And this is hot water and geysers. And he knew that they were thermal waters from deep inside the earth. And so he wrote a book, The Dead Heart of Australia. By the way, since my interest in this, this has been reprinted, this book. You can buy it at 250 bucks. <laughs> um, uh, I still go to the library. <laughs> 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 but there it is. That's his account. And now, in the book, he did some wonderful things. And now, I've coloured this up, but one of the things he did was he looked at the temperature gradients and he identified the hot spots. Now, this was fascinating. Here was this professor, a uh, hundred odd years ago. He visited the Great Artesian Basin. He was interested in where the heat was rising from the interior of the Earth <coughs> in the vicinity of the Great Artesian Basin. <coughs> He says, the rocks of the deeper layers contain water. The quartz in granite owes its milky whiteness to minute cavities. The vast steam cloud which hangs over factory volcanoes is due to this type of scheme. So he's saying well, the water in the Artesian Basin is like steam from volcanoes. Like that. It's the expansion of the steam that provides the enormous propelling forces for volcanoes. And, of course, we have these days, we know about deep ocean vents. So, Gregory said, I therefore emphatically reaffirm that these wells are not maintained by the existing flow of rainfall. And this is a hundred years ago. A hundred years later, the Queensland government brought in legislation to declare it is recharged from surface rainfall. And he said the following factors, chemical composition, the associated combustible gas, the temperature of the water, and the occurrence of high water pressures in areas of former volcanic activity. So there we are. And so that's the way Gregory saw it. He saw all the volcanoes around here and the mineral resources around it. Now if we draw a section through there, by the way I also want to um, 
that line of volcanoes there. Remember a year or so ago, there was a ship of the Royal Navy that ran aground at Norfolk Island somewhere? Ran, 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 ran into one of them. Okay, these undersea volcanoes. And, uh, and that's what it's like. And that's another section. Once again, it's an exaggerated vertical scale. And here's the very steep fault off the coast of Newcastle and so on. Here are these, uh, here's Lord Howe Island. You see, that's the thing they ran into. Um, it has one. But there's residual volcanic waters have accumulated underneath the Great Artesian Basin. And there's the mineral occurrences you see around the similar sources and petroleum wells. So, this upset, uh, uh, Gregory upset the establishment. And in 1907, Pittman, the government geologist, New South Wales, presented a paper to the Royal Society. At one point, he says, suffice it to say, now this is an interesting, you see, they didn't think for themselves, this is important. Suffice it to say that the view adopted by most American geologists that all underground waters have their origin in rainfall has much to recommend it. So in other words, you weren't too sure, but if it's the American side, that must be right. <laughs> and of course, you've got to remember that um, uh, Gregory was a Scotsman. And you see, he was causing trouble. And in the meantime, Gregory had uh, just resigned. He'd, in effect, Gregory was the only person in Australia that believed what Gregory was saying. So he went back to uh, teach at the University of Glasgow. And so, but the argument continued in Australia. And so, suffice it to say, if the American side, it's under, it's rainfall, and he concluded that maybe, <laughs> now, this, I've read one paper and it's, it's, I don't know how on earth he comes up with this conclusion. It may be confidently reaffirmed <laughs> that the Great Australian Water Variation is a true arterial area and that the water of the flowing wells had a meteorological and not a plutonic, plutonic origin. Now he got it absolutely wrong a hundred years ago and the Queensland government is still wrong today. And a hundred years later. In the year 2000, the Queensland government passed legislation to proclaim the areas along the Great Divide. The water was told where it had to go. Now that was an also another important thing because that meant that the Queensland government were also claiming the ownership of the water. You get the idea? The legislation was introduced without any notice of the affected landholders. Now, when the legislation came out, all of a sudden my phone rang out from the farmers in Queensland along the, great, along the recharge areas. And they couldn't work out uh, why all of a sudden they were being told by the Queensland government that they couldn't use the water that was falling on their own land. Because they had to let it soak into the ground because of the recharge of the Great Artesian Basin. So there you are, there's been a century of error. Now, one of the consequences of this, and this is a substance in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. In the San Joaquin Valley, so much water is pumped out that the land is subsided by that amount. Now I knew all about this, about 50 you know, more. In 1952, well before most of you were born, in 1952, I was working on the design. I was in Denver, Colorado, and I was working on the design of the irrigation works in this area. That was, you know, around about there, sort of thing. And we had to take into account the continued subsidence of the ground in the design of our canals. Because if we weren't careful, well, our blessed canals would be trying to go uphill. <laughs> and so we had to design them with very uh, uh, steep uh, gradients on them and with checks and control structures so that we could control the level no matter which way the ground went up and down. And can you imagine trying to design an irrigation works with canals when the ground is changing at that sort of rate? Anyway, we, uh, it, it is amazing, isn't it? Right. So this is what's happened. Over the past hundred years, they've taken out a hundred times the volume of Sydney Harbour. How's that for recharge from rainfall? The waste is over 80%. Five governments are involved. 
It supports the present production in the region of that. It's wasted. The present waste is, represents an annual loss of future national production of $38 million each day. Now, I told you about the hotspots. Now, we've got all this wonderful satellite stuff and we know a lot more about it. And if you have a look at the heat flow in Australia, the hotspots in Australia are underneath the Great Artesian Basin. Now, that, you remember the, I showed you the picture of the Great Artesian Basin to natural scale, just the thin thermal blanket. The thin thermal blanket, if you like, allows the heat to accumulate under the blanket. So the heat accumulates under the blanket, and this here is a potential geothermal energy resource which could be the greatest in the world. So it's one of the world's best sites for the generation of geothermal energy because the hot ground is covered by a thin thermal blanket and you only need fairly shallow drills in order to get into it. Now, I'm trying to encourage the development of that geothermal energy, but the last thing I want to have is um, people drilling holes and putting water into the ground. I think we should be able to do it with more sophisticated techniques uh, the sort of thing, say, so, uh, a refrigeration plant uh, uh, works very e effectively by, by uh, uh, turning electrical energy into cold, and I want to turn heat into electrical energy by using the similar recycling. But uh, uh, another alternative, of course, is uh, things like uh, ma massive thermocouples. But I think there is potential for the development of great resources there. So that's another thing to look forward to. Thank you. I want to talk about passions and fallacies. Uh, you, you know about some of you know all about it, but but uh, it's it's very topical and it helps you to understand present politics and present social attitudes. Now uh, this is just a, uh, a fallacy is an error found on false reasoning, and a fashion is just conventional usage. We're referring to dress, but you can try really conventional thinking. You know, political fashion is called political correctness. You get the idea there are people think uh, in a consistent and easy way, and there are established views, and people feel comfortable if they, uh, if they share the same attitudes. Do you get the idea? People feel comfortable if other people agree with them. People feel uncomfortable and other people have a slightly different view. Now, there are always uncertainties. Certainties are greatly magnified by an inability to determine truth. When matters go wrong, we blame others. But then I, this is what I want. Signposts pointing to trouble. What do you, this is what I try to teach the young people. Now, Things do go wrong, and here's something that went wrong on one of the things I was involved in. And this was just a, a penstock that burst when accidentally subjected to pressures greater than the maximum design pressure. We worked that later, that it should have failed. <laughs> but, uh, but, and it was due to a little tiny crack. The bursting was caused by a crack the size of a fingernail. And you can see the chevron markings, they're pointing to the position of the crack. The fall could not have been detected with the technology available at the time of construction. We didn't have the mechanisms just to detect a hair crack like that. Only later with ultrasound you could, by bouncing sound waves through the steel, you could pick up a crack like that. You couldn't pick it up with a straight x-ray through it because it just went straight, straight past it. Just a tiny hairline, you wouldn't pick it up. Uh, now, in the... 1960s, I was involved in the design of projects like this in Tasmania. And we were looking at similar projects around the world. And there had been a series of failures, and I was sent overseas to uh, look at the failures. And one of the things I looked at was the failure of this particular dam here in, in southern France. And this had been a thin ice dam that had gone from there to there. And on one dark night, the dam burst and the entire wall of water uh, just marched downstream 
there were 512 people killed in the village downstream. And so I went there to study it all and, and so on. And then I visited this site here where a huge landslide had just fallen off the mountain, fell into the reservoir, and a wall of water that high went over the top of the dam. That little shed there was wiped away and quite a few engineers were involved in there. They, they, they were even trying to televise the movement. And, and there was 2,000, or almost 2,000 people killed in it. And I visited that site and inspected. And went. Now, fortunately at the time, and I just want to say the, there were warning movements and days prior to the site, nature always gives a warning when things like that happen. So it's a matter of noting it. But in, in looking at all of that, uh, I found that the, my professional colleagues in Europe uh, were very nice to me in, in revealing all the technical background to it. But I began to realise that these failures did not occur due to for technical reasons. There were a, a number of human factors involved which I could quietly detect. And so I was thinking of organisational factors, attitudes, personal, unusual. What are the things that indicated trouble? And arising from that, when I got back to Hobart, I couldn't tell the people in Europe what I thought of it all, because it would have been offensive to them. I was able to tell my colleagues in Hobart to, how some of these things occurred. And I had these signposts to danger. This was about 30 or 40 years ago. And I should point out, because I became alert to potential for trouble, it means for my, you know, for the last 30 odd years since the 1970s, I've been looking at things in a slightly different perspective because I have been alert to the signposts to danger. Now, is the lure of fashion. Young people may become so dominated by fashion, they become quite fanatical in their will to confirm to a particular item of fashion. Now, if you're like me, uh, as a grandparent, I've got 11 grandchildren, try trying to tell a, 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 a teenage granddaughter that the bare midriff is quite inappropriate in the middle of winter. <laughs> uh, and I almost caused a disruption in the household. On one occasion, I, I tried to sit at the dining room table with a spiky hairdo like one of my sons. And, 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 and one of my other sons or daughters-in-law quietly took me out of the room and straightened me up. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that when people get uh, totally consumed with fashion, the, the fanaticism is not rational. And it offers opportunities for manipulation. Now, so the fashion industry deliberately creates fanaticism. People have to wear this fashion or wear the other fashion, and they're driven by it if they don't, they're not fashionable. People will laugh at them because they're not fashionable. And so the fashion industry deliberately creates fanaticism. And I say that every one of us carries a baggage of fashionable attitudes. You see, I laugh at spiky hairdos. There are fashions in... Mo oh, can you get rid of that again? Fashions in most fields of human activity, including science, engineering, medicine, law, we refer to political correctness and note the way our politicians strive to conform. They believe it brings in votes. You get the idea? It's comfortable to be fashionable. But when we're fashionable, it's dangerous because we assume that other people are thinking for us. We're comfortable when we're fashionable and we don't have to think constructively or creatively anymore because we're safe. You get the idea? Now, this is what I noticed in Europe. Arrogance and fashionable thinking go together. Le leaders of fashionable trends are idolised. And that gives them the confidence and capacity to lead. If you've got a lot of people following along behind you and all admiring everything you do, 
you think you've got all almighty and your judgment's perfect. When we are arrogant, we drop our vigilance. Arrogance is insidious and it erodes our sensitivity. Arrogant leaders demand obedience. Hitler, for example, Stalin. <laughs> okay. And an intolerant of ideas. Entire groups of professionals can be caught up in a fashion they do not recognise. We have that in law and in medicine, engineering, politics. Muddled management. A great signpost to danger. And this is where we're in difficulty in Australia with our constitution. Uncertainty about responsibilities always indicates danger. Nobody knows who's in charge, except that some arrogant thug tries to assume control. Specialist skills are not self-coordinating. Unity requires specialists to understand one another. Arrogant people may sense uncertainty and weakness in others and assume control. Time and time again I've noticed this, that the arrogant people notice that the thoughtful people may be uncertain. And the arrogant people then just come in and assume control and tell everybody what to do without understanding what's actually happening. That's another danger. Loss of corporate knowledge. We've had this in Australia. The expertise of a firm is the expertise of the people. And when the key people leave, it's gone. A feature of modern business management is the use of staff on short-term contracts. They call it outsourcing. Well, I've had... Uh, this has been brought to my notice. Now, a guy will ring me up. And he said, Lance, do you know anything about so-and-so or such and so? I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, we've got the job to do this or the other. Oh, I said, how on earth did you get the job? Oh, we know so-and-so. Outsourcing, you see. So they've outs So some blessed company or government department have outsourced a job, and it's the first time that guy has ever done a job like that in his life, and he doesn't know how to get, how to, how to, get to square one. And that is absolutely ridiculous, outsourcing, because it means you're handing work to the incompetent. And it's rather, everybody's got to start somewhere, but at least it's got to be done intelligently. And so, and then I get rung up a few months, you know, a year or so later, and that's, we've <laughs> got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Such firms are a business risk to themselves and to others. Ignoring, this is another one. In almost all cases of fear are preceded by warnings. Nature gives a warning. It's always worrying when properly considered warnings are ignored. It's a clear sign of impending failure when the whistleblower is criticised, ridiculed, threatened or attacked. In some cases, in other countries, they just shoot them dead. Bad sportsmanship. I know this from... Occasional blundering is part of the game. The good sportsman acknowledges his blunders and thanks people for help. The bad sportsman who denies his blunders is in the grip of senility. Most politicians are not very good sportsmen. Okay. Now you've seen this. I'll go to the next one. Now, why did that happen? The clash of cultures. Now, the Mbali episode should be looked at as a clash of cultures. To a certain extent, uh, it was an attack on decadence. Nobody ever says that, but that is the reality of it, unfortunately. And we have the dominating influence of the American media, publishing and especially attempts to influence attitudes of the world's teenagers. That was what was happening in Bali the attitudes and behaviour of the teenagers, the American assault on the world economy, backed by US military power. Now that causes a clash of cultures, and so here we have, this is, this is what the rest, I'm trying to point out to you, there are fashions here which the world at large is objecting to. You ready? Do you know what? What I mean by cool, the marketing of cool. 
<laughs> okay. The teenage market in America. There are 32 million American teenagers. They spend 100 billion themselves and push parents to spend another 50. That additional 50 is regarded as uh, guilt money, you see. The total of 150, 300 billion Australian each year, or almost half the Australian GDP. In other words, the American teenage market, the market that sells things to teenagers and the teenagers are buying and their parents are buying for them, is a lucrative market equal to half the Australian GDP. An incredible market. 75% of US teenagers have a television in their room, 33% have their own personal computer. Parents who often provide guilt money. The huge disposable funds of teenagers have attracted powerful corporations that focus on the manipulation and management of teenagers. So we have a huge advertising and media industry focusing on teenagers because they've got money to spend equal to half of Australia's GDP. So they're focusing on the kids because they're, and they're going to get money out of them. You ready? The teenage girl stereotype, the bare midriff, okay? Prematurely adult, consumed with sex, flaunting of sexuality, consumed by appearances but insecure, but there is continual pressure to look cool and be accepted, distrust of parents and te teachers. Now, this is the sort of thing that causes a great deal of dismay in the Muslim countries and We've had a reaction to that in Bali. The boys, crude, loud, obnoxious, and in your face, aggressive, resentful, consumed by testosterone, need to dominate, insecure, distrust of most others, treat girls as sex objects. What do the girls say? Is that reasonable? Young people here, am I on the ball or am I not? Eh? I, I'm, I'm, I'm right out of court, am I? <laughs> okay, right. Well, I'm trying to work it out. Advertisements and programs directed to teenagers reveal these stereotypes. There is a systematic portrayal of rebelliousness. Okay. It's part of the advertising worldview that your parents are creeps, teachers are nerds and idiots, authority figures are laughable, and nobody can really understand kids except the corporate sponsor, like Nike, okay? Or Adidas. The corporate sponsor has become a superhero. And the media drive in America is viewed with alarm worldwide, and particularly in the Muslim countries. Fashions and financial management from the government. Well, what do we do? Okay. okay. And here it is. The, you see this in the uh, AR magazine. And have you, there's the printing of money. These, you've seen that before. Household savings. If, Dropped in Australia, we don't save anymore. We're not spending it. Anyway, now, this is just, you'll read about this sort of thing in the financial papers. There is natural capitalism. You have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull, the herd multiplies, the economy grows, you sell them and retire on the income. That's natural capitalism. There's a new variety of capitalism these days. Be Enron venture capitalism. You have two cows, you sell three of them. So you're a publicly traded company using the letters of credit opened by your brother-in-law at the bank and they execute a debt equity swap with an associated general offer so that you'll get all four cows back with a tax exemption for five. <laughs> hmm? Okay. Yeah, this is happening all the time. The milk rights of the six cows are transferred to an intermediate in Cayman Island, secretly owned by a majority shareholder to sell the rights of all seven cows back to your listed company. The animal report says that the company owns eight cows with an option on one more. Repeat as necessary until you have $62 billion in assets and then declare bankruptcy. <laughs> okay? It's the new order. 
And you've seen that sort of thing. Okay. Let's, let's just finish it off with the, the Endersby homily. You ready? All of the present public infrastructure, this is a national, in the politics of human nature, all of the present public infrastructure was planned and funded by government. Planning was long term, so on. The private sector planned and invested on a long term basis. Many workers had job security, responded to the company. You never hear a word of company loyalty these days, no? Almost all of the present system of community services were established by people of humanitarian spirit. The hospitals, and we had lots of people as volunteers. Not only in hospitals, and there, there was the you know, parents and teachers at school, and there's the people that run the yacht clubs, and the, the guys, and the women that run the girl guides, and the Boy Scouts. A huge amount of voluntary activity. Present reality. End of job security and company loyalty. Uncertain role of governments. An utopian vision by governments that a private sector is going to create prosperity. Privatisation of public infrastructure. End of government planning. Less sense of community responsibility, fewer volunteers. End of love and friendship. Is that very common? End of love and friendship. Unloved children. Down at, down at Frankston we've got a large number of unmarried mothers and you see them taking the kids around the shopping centres giving them a clip on the ear about every five steps. End of unloved children. End of commitment. You know, a relationship is an arrangement for sex without duty of care. Or duty of care. Women's studies in universities is training for gender warfare. That'll raise a few hackles. Can we go on that way? Thank you. Thank you.